I shot an arrow into the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where. For so swiftly it flew, the sight could not follow in its flight. I breathed the song into the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where. For who has sight so keen and strong that it can follow the flight of song? Long, long afterward, in an oak, I found the arrow, still unbroke, and the song from beginning to end I found again in the heart of a friend. Now, the reason that I open with a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, thank you for those of you that knew that one, is to remind us of two things. One, that we as marketers, as communicators, as business people can be inspired from almost anything. And we heard from Linda Boff today that stories are everywhere if you just take the time to look. And we should be inspired by all the things around us. And I was a classics major as an undergraduate. And this is possibly the only practical use of classics that you will see in the business world. But it reminds me that humanity is eternal. We are the same as we were two, three, four thousand years ago and more. And we have common traits as human beings. The second thing that the Longfellow poem reminds me of is that there is a dichotomy. The arrow and the song. You know, we talk about targeting and precision in marketing, and we also talk about appeals to emotion and the heart, right? And each of those is equally important. It's the science and the art of marketing that we're talking about. And speaking of affection, speaking of love, we all, at some point, must remember our first. Like, oh, they, they may have wait, made you wait long enough for it, right? You had to be satisfied with just living vicariously through others, maybe through older siblings, classmates who knew a little more than you did, maybe even watching it on movies. The longing, the anticipation, the excitement with which we waited until we finally got it. I'm talking, of course, about our first email address. <laughs> Put your dirty minds away, people. And whether it was Pine on a Unix system at your university, <laughs> for those of us that can go way back, whether it was on AOL, for the, those of us who can go back even farther, and still do in some cases, or whether it was on Yahoo, God bless you, or Gmail, or Hotmail. We all had an email address. And when you got that account, you remember the excitement of when someone first wrote to you and you received that notification. Jamil! Jamil is here! Woo! We don't quite have that excitement about it anymore, do we? And that's okay. That's okay. But the thing is, one of the reasons we don't have that excitement is because social media came along and ruined everything. Right? Without any notice, literally, we had notifications that were cluttering up our desktop, our mobile phones, everywhere we went. And whether it was the immediate gratification that we felt from receiving a retweet or a reply or a like, social media tied into that primordial sense of our brain. That I do this, you give that, right? The give and take. And suddenly, email wasn't so sexy anymore. But, when you think about email, with respect to all of these notifications, it doesn't seem like such a bad option anymore, does it? Because here's the thing. Right now, we're dealing with a dual deficit. And I'll talk about these two deficits in just a moment. And this notion of precision and emotion 
appeal to the brain and appeal to the heart are equally as important when we put our email newsletters together. And it still matters in business. So one of the deficits that we're dealing with is a deficit of trust. Consumers don't trust brands in particular. They don't trust the government. They don't trust the media the way that they used to. And how do you regain trust? You do it through transparency. You do it through showing the humanity within your company. You do it by appealing to that softer side of people. And at the same time we're dealing with a deficit of trust, we're also dealing with a deficit in attention. Where people are flitting from app to app, from platform to platform, from message to message, without really spending much time. So the question is, how do you capture people's emotion, capture their heart, at the same time that you capture their attention? So I want to start out with some statistics about email so we're all grounded and we understand where we're working from and why email is still so important. Clearly, you all think it's important because look at this room, it's filled. If email didn't matter anymore, this room would be empty, which was my fear. <laughs> Thank you for restoring my trust in humanity. So when you look across the world, you look at some email statistics, starting here in the United States. This year, we have about 244 million people who use email. It's a pretty good number when you consider there are 350, 360 million people in the United States. Maybe a little more. Tom Webster, check me on that. 360. 360. See? Keep your statisticians close. Next year, or excuse me, by 2020, there will be 254 million email accounts in the United States. Across the world, 3 billion email accounts by 2020. 3 billion email accounts. But look, here's the dirty secret. Because I know you're all thinking, well, Facebook already has 2 billion people. They'll probably get to 3 billion by then, too. The thing is, with every single social platform that you sign on to, every new app you open that has a social element to it where communication is involved, every single one of those requires an email address. You think about that. You still need the ability to contact people for updates and terms and conditions and other things like that. And it's all predicated on owning an email address first and foremost. So it's not going away anytime soon. Now, when we look at what marketers do with their emails, of marketers that were surveyed last year by marketing profs, 15% of them said they don't regularly review they're open and click-through rates. 15% are leaving that on the table. Further, only 23% of them have actually integrated their websites with their email database to be able to track what goes on, to be able to see where that click leads. Right? This is 2017. It shouldn't be happening like this. this these are table stakes at this point. Right? We need to do better. The good news is consumers want to hear from you. 86% of customers who have a relationship with a brand say they would love to hear from them on a monthly basis. There's your invitation. 15% of them even say they'd like to hear from you on a daily basis. That's insane. I mean, think about that. If you could find 15% of your customer base that wants to hear from you every single day, think of the power. Think of the advocates you could create. Think of the relationship you could develop with them by using drip techniques and you know, using your email database a lot smarter. And I'm, I'm not going to get into the, the technics, of the, the, the specifics of what you have to do. That, that's like a Christopher Penn presentation. I want to tell you about philosophically why this is important and, and why you need to start grasping these things. And again, thinking back to human behavior. We think, seemingly, that the Kardashians invented the selfie. 
The selfie goes all the way back to Greek mythology with Narcissus, who was on his way to meet his beloved, and he stopped to get a drink out of the pond, and he saw his reflection in the pond and fell in love with his reflection, so much so that he would never leave it. His beloved, by the way, grew old and lonely. Her name? Any classics majors out there? Echo. 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 Pinch hitting for Pedro Bourbon. Manny Mota. Mota. <laughs> we have like five airplane fans in the crowd. That's bad news. It's bad news. So this is a behavior that goes all the way back to ancient Greece or further. This is embedded within human nature. And it's so bad, actually. Anyone? It's, it's so bad. Thank you, oh, three martini lunch breath. It's, it's so bad that last year, this is, ab this is absolutely true, there were more deaths attributed to selfies than there were to shark attacks. This guy is obviously in double jeopardy, but <laughs> human nature, we are so self-involved that we don't see the cliff, right? That's just the way it is, and that's okay. That's okay, but understanding that and knowing what you have to work with, that's important because that can make the difference between a successful and a failing marketing program and a successful or a failing newsletter. People love to hear the sound of their names. They love being addressed individually. 18.8% open rates of personalized emails versus only 13.1% open rates of non-personalized emails. Right? So you've increased your effectiveness by about 50% simply by using someone's name, targeting. So that message is appropriate. Message for you, sir. Now, not all targeting has to be quite as effective and deadly as that. Don't shoot the messenger indeed. But understanding that people like stuff that's delivered directly to them, instead of leaving it up to the algorithms of Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and whatever else, for them to maybe see, or to require you to pay to get something in front of them. You own your email database. You own the relationship with the people in that database. Use it to your advantage. Now I'm going to talk about how not to do it first. Okay? Um, and I'm going to go out on a limb here because I'm going to use my former employer. Um, and I know Christopher Barger, who used to work for my former employer's major competitor, is probably snickering in the front row. That is Ford Motor Company. And I'm, I'll, I'll tell you the story behind a few things in a little bit, but at Ford, we had actually employed Blue State Digital, which was the digital team behind the Obama campaign in 2008, to help us with advocates. We thought the secret was social. It was actually email. They said you only need three things to be really successful. A first name, an email address, and a zip code. Right From there, you can start building out your communications cadence. And we we spoke the gospel of this to our brethren in marketing. I was in communications. I got this email earlier this year, 2017. The message still has not gotten through because I want you to, to explore with me what this email sounds like. So Ford says new newsletters are coming. Fantastic. I love newsletters. I write a newsletter. This is going to be awesome. And look, they have customized content. This is like the holy grail. Message for you, so. So <laughs> let's take a look through the entirety of this email as it came through my inbox. I'm going to roll the video. There we go. Oh, it's auto video. So let's, let's see. Start exploring. Born to Baja for you outdoor enthusiasts. Great. And now we've got... Ooh, Guardians of the Galaxy, a sweepstakes, fantastic. I can win a car, 
Oh, maybe I want to go on an adventure ride on a Ford Explorer, outdoorsy, good. Oh, wait, another giveaway? Now, wait a minute. There's, oh, well, maybe I want to look at the new Fusion. That's a nice car, right? Oh, well, no, I can download a mobile app now. And, oh, no, maybe I want to visit the dealer. Um, oh, oh, maybe I want to hear about Ford's corporate successes. <laughs> what the hell is it they want me to do here? There is, it makes no sense to me. They've got about 83 calls to action in a single email, right? It's completely frustrating. Now, their philosophy may be spray and pray. Well, somebody's going to click something, right? That's not personalized content that they're promising, right? So, all right, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's go back, let's click on that Start Exploring button and see exactly what it gets me, because maybe I can sign up for one of 18 different newsletters, right? For the Mustang owner, for the electric car enthusiast, for you know, just the gearhead in general. So let's click on Start Exploring and see what happens. It sends me to their sales site. A crummy commercial? <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to explore, right? They've got me there under a false premise, right? So what did they miss? What are some of the features of great newsletters that we can expect? And, and by no means is this comprehensive, but these are just four off the top of my head that are essential, that provide value to people. Because ultimately, that's what you're in the business of doing, is providing value to your subscribers so they will in turn show some kind of loyalty to you by clicking on your content, by purchasing your items, by inviting you back to their inbox week after week, day after day, however frequently you might do it. But you have to set expectations, right?